Thumbs up. Good afternoon and welcome. Just give it a couple moments for everybody to get logged in here. All right. As everyone is joining, I'd like to welcome you to our Baptist Behavioral Health Grand Rounds. I'm Dr. Francesca Barello Sims, Director of Education and Training for Baptist Medical Center in Wilson Children's Behavioral Health. Before we begin, just a few quick notes on today's presentation. If you have any questions, please do submit these into the chat or the Q&A box. And at this time, if you are logged in through a mobile device that doesn't show your name, please sign into the chat and include your credentials as well. All right. I'd like to welcome Dr. Anastasiades. Dr. Maria Anastasiades is a fellowship trained clinical health psychologist. She received her PsyD from Mercer University College of Health Professions in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Anastasiades is a member of the Society for Health Psychology, who provides psychosocial treatment for chronic health conditions. She specializes in hospital-based care and has experience working as part of a multidisciplinary healthcare team. Her areas of expertise include life-threatening and terminal illness, behavioral pain management, coping with physical health issues, stress, and pre-surgical evaluations. Welcome, Dr. Anastasiades. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about the biopsychosocial treatment of chronic pain. OK, technical difficulties already. Somehow my uh, thing isn't going. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so my objectives today are pretty straightforward. So I want to talk about psychosocial factors affecting chronic pain, um, talk about some brief cognitive and or behavioral interventions for folks with chronic pain, and also talk about providing culturally competent care for a diverse patient population. So regardless of the setting that we're in, and I understand that there are lots of people in lots of settings here, lots of different types of providers, no matter what setting you're in, you're going to see folks with chronic pain. About a quarter of U.S. citizens are affected by chronic pain, and it's one of the most common conditions for folks coming to primary care. Um, we spend a lot of money as a healthcare system on managing chronic pain more than we spend on cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. Um, and then lifetime prevalence of chronic pain patients attempting suicide is pretty high, and even ideation is pretty high as well. So start with a definition of, of pain, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So that's really important. The, the experience of pain is both sensory and emotional. It's not either or. Um, I, I think a couple of things that are important to think about when we're defining pain and understanding pain it's always a personal experience affected by lots of different things. Um, pain and nociception are two different things. Uh, throughout their life experiences, people learn about pain, learn how pain is experienced, um, and people's report of pain should be respected. We only live in our own bodies. We don't live in anyone else's. Uh, so we should be respectful of other folks' report of their experience. Um, so acute pain is adaptive. Right. If you touch a hot stove, your hand jerks back. That's that's good. It keeps you safe. But ongoing and chronic pain can really be detrimental to functioning and just overall well-being. Um, and then being able to report pain verbally is only one way to assess pain and to be able to um, express pain. So folks who can't describe pain verbally um, certainly doesn't mean they're not experiencing pain. A couple of important terms, so acute pain, adaptive, three months or less, usually kind of right at the time of injury. Um, Pre-chronic is between acute and chronic pain, and then chronic pain is pain that lasts beyond expected healing time. Um, it can exist without a clear reason at all. It can be a symptom of another illness or can be an illness in its own right. Um, recurrent pain is pain like headaches or pelvic pain that is intermittent rather than kind of day in and day out ongoing in the background. Cancer pain is a unique condition that 
we won't talk much about today, but it's worth being aware of. And then central sensitization is a condition for folks who are particularly on long-term and high-dose opioids, um, but the spinal cord becomes really good at sending pain signals to the brain, and the brain really has a hard time ignoring those signals. Um, again, particularly a, a risk for folks who, who have long-term opioid use for chronic pain. So real briefly, this is a kind of the idea of nociception, particularly on the afferent neuron side. So we have nerves that are, live inside our body with nerve endings in our skin and other parts of our body. Those nerve endings collect signals and send them up to the brain. Um, and then the brain also sends signals back down and out into either our autonomic nervous system or into our muscles. Um, so there is sort of a directional um, experience of, of pain sensation, right? That it comes out from the body um, and that the brain sends back information out to the body as well. Um, this image I think is useful just to take a look at all the different parts of our brain that are affected with pain. So the red part pain only is the thalamus. So that's like our, our sensory relay station there in the brain. Um, but lots of other parts of the brain are activated. So the somatosensory cortex, again, part of that um, sensory experience, but also the prefrontal cortex. You can see my, my little uh, mouse here. So the prefrontal cortex, of course, integrating information, cognitions about pain, um, and modulating thoughts and feelings. Um, the ACC here uh, includes cognitive processing and emotional processing. The hippocampus over here is responsible for memory um, and is activated with pain. And then also the amygdala responsible for emotion processing and activation as well. So a lot is going on in the brain when, when a pain signals are being received. So I put this slide here at the start of our talk. Um, I really encourage y'all as we're going through this to kind of think about what patient comes to mind when we're talking about pain syndromes, pain symptoms, um, kind of comorbid symptoms. You know, who do you imagine when we're talking about chronic pain? Tune into your biases, tune into kind of your stereotypes. Those stereotypes affect how you interact with patients, um, and patients perceive that too, right? And so, you know, tune into kind of what you imagine the the typical quote unquote chronic pain patient is. In my experience, I don't know that there is a typical patient per se, um, because chronic pain affects folks from all walks of life. Um, but I just encourage y'all to tune into your kind of own stereotypes and biases as we're going through this talk. So some syn pain syndrome. So this is what you might see in a medical record. Um, headaches or migraines chronic low back pain, complex regional pain syndrome, um, or CRIPS, arthritis, fibromyalgia, uh, neuropathic pain, particularly diabetic neuropathy, uh, phantom limb pain, post-amputation, and this can occur for folks who even have um, like amputation of just of a, a toe, I mean, not just, but uh, certainly doesn't have to be like an AKA for there to be some phantom um, pain. And then cancer pain is, of course, a kind of particular syndrome that again, we won't cover too terribly much in today's talk. A lot of comorbid psychiatric conditions with folks who have chronic pain. Two thirds of folks have a comorbid psychiatric disorder. Um, and I would probably argue that there is an even greater percentage of folks who have some distress and emotional symptoms related to chronic pain certainly depression, um, anxiety, kind of generalized and or panic, PTSD and trauma. Uh, folks who with a trauma history are a lot more likely to have a chronic pain condition. Substance use disorder, not just opioid uh, use, but also alcohol use and, and other substances. Um, a lot of folks who use marijuana uh, and kind of debatable how useful that is for folks with chronic pain. Uh, insomnia, a lot of insomnia, 
Um, and then cognitive changes, which isn't sort of a condition per se, but it's important to be aware of how pain affects attention, particularly in the midst of a pain episode. And then a lot of medicines have a lot of side effects, including mental fogginess, um, fatigue, tiredness, um, and a lot of folks are on lots of different medicines and those can have kind of this layered effect on cognition. And then personality traits. So kind of two personality traits have been identified in this population. Higher harm avoidance, which uh, is folks who are fearful, really sensitive to criticism, pessimistic, um, folks requiring high levels of reassurance from the healthcare team. Uh, and then the other personality trait is lower self-directedness. So trouble coping, trouble setting, and a defined meaningful goals, folks with low motivation. You certainly can see how these um, kind of personality flavors can really interact with this person's ability to engage with their healthcare team. So how do we assess pain? Um, lots of different ways. Everybody who's ever been to the doctor has seen the faces scale, it's in every exam room. Uh, sometimes they put the one through 10 scale on there with it as well, with usually 10 being the worst pain you could possibly imagine. Um, that's one of the main ways that folks in, particularly in medical settings, that's kind of part of the, the intake or the check-in or free administration of medicines rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. And uh, in, a, a, in acute care, especially kind of different uh, medicines are targets for different categories, like different blocks of pain. So if it's a one through three, use this medicine. If it's a four through six, use this. If it's a seven or greater, use this. Um, so the one through 10 scale is often used in medicine. It's one of our, um, few kind of concrete tools that we can use to manage, uh, to assess pain. For folks who are nonverbal, the flack, so face, legs, activity, crying, and consolability, those are the, the what flack stands for. So that's kind of an assessment that you can use and observe folks with who are nonverbal um, to see if they're experiencing pain. Um, vitals are somewhat helpful. Sometimes you'll see like heart rate rise when folks are in pain. Um, it's not sort of consistent or um, the only way to measure pain and a lot of other things affect vitals as well, but sometimes that can be um, a useful tool as well. Um, the, Mag the McGill pain questionnaire or brief pain inventory, this is, most folks have seen this too. So it's a, a paper that has an outline of a body on it and people mark kind of draw X's wherever they're having pain on their body. Um, what I like about this inventory is that it also on the back side has questions rating on a scale of one to 10, um, kind of rating the impact of your pain on sleep, on ability to work, on your mood, um, on all different types of things in terms of function. And that's really important when we're thinking about setting goals for, for chronic pain management. Uh, the pain catastrophizing scale is a nice self-report, which is useful as we get kind of get into treatment, gives us some useful, um, a place to start in terms of figuring out what kind of cognitive interventions we could go with. And then for folks who are doing formal psychological testing, this is primarily uh, pre-surgical evaluations for spinal cord stimulators or other interventions. The MVMD has some chronic pain norms and then the MMPI as well as really very frequently used. It's unlikely you would use the, those types of psych testing um, outside of a pre-surgical evaluation, although you certainly could. So starting treatment, um, setting goals related to function, that is so, so critical for this population. I even have had folks where, honestly, their average pain score on the kind of one to 10 scale didn't change much. Um, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that we haven't made any progress because they had changes in their ability to function. Um, and that is really kind of the core, most important thing that you can, can identify in treatment of chronic pain. What do you wanna be able to do? Um, 
Do you want to be able to sleep better? Do you want to be able to work? Do you want to be able to take care of your home, your family? Um, what is important to you in terms of functioning? Um, zero pain is not an appropriate goal for pain management. Um, you know, that doesn't always need to be said exactly in that way. I think folks are more and more kind of aware that we can't have zero pain. That's just not reasonable. Um, life is painful, but there's, you're going to experience some pain, particularly if you have some comorbid other conditions, um, pain is going to be there, but it's, you know, what level of pain do we want to target in order for you to be able to function? Um, so again, assessing the functional impact of pain, is it affecting work, home, taking care of yourself physically, um, managing your own medicines, taking care of the other things you need to do for other physical conditions like exercise or um, eating healthy. Um, how is pain affecting your interpersonal relationships? How is it affecting your relationship with your partner or your children or your colleagues at work? Um, those areas are, are places where we can make change, even if the pain number doesn't change. And then, you know, we all are here because we know that multimodal and interdisciplinary treat, treatment is the best practice for pain, but our patients may not be aware of that, right? Um, in the 90s, the drug companies kind of pushed for pain as the fifth vital sign, right? So it's a medical condition to have pain and the only intervention is this pill that gets you down to zero. So we're kind of having to combat that messaging directly or indirectly um, when we're talking about treating chronic pain and, and setting reasonable goals. Okay, so I'm not a prescriber, I'm a psychologist. Um, and even for folks who are not prescribers, you, you should know what your patients are taking, right? If we're, if we're engaging in biopsychosocial treatment, we need to know what are the biological and physiological interventions that this patient has at their disposal? What tools do they have in that regard? Um, so non-opioid, this is just an overview again as a non-prescriber. Um, NSAIDs like Advil, um, acetaminophen, Tylenol, um, opioids. So they're can be short acting or long acting. Lots of side effects, nausea, constipation, drowsiness. Usually folks should not be driving or uh, working depending on their work. Um, if they're using these kind of medicines, um, they certainly have a risk of misuse and physiologic dependence. Tramadol. So tramadol interferes with pain signals like an opioid, but it also works on norepinephrine and serotonin like an antidepressant. So it's kind of in its own little um, box there. Uh, topicals, so Voltaren, diclofenac gel, or lidocaine patches and creams. Muscle relaxers, a lot of folks have muscle tension, muscle spasms. So these are often prescribed um, for those purposes. Uh, they, make, they make you sleepy. So a lot of people will have them prescribed for bedtime, around bedtime. Um, diazepam is a benzo, but it can be prescribed as well as a muscle relaxer. So additional analgesics. TCAs, um, antidepressants, Cymbalta or duloxetine is really commonly prescribed, venlafaxine or Effexor. Um, and then for folks with nerve pain, particularly gabapentin and pregabalin um, are very often prescribed. Gabapentin, there are some folks on some quite high doses of gabapentin. Um, it can make you really drowsy and sleepy. So I've had a lot of folks who are kind of struggling with, you know, how do I maximize this medicine without it putting me to sleep three times a day throughout the day? Um, so that can be kind of a struggle with that medicine. Um, and then headaches are kind of their own category, uh, but there are a couple of medicines like topiramate, which is a prevention taken daily, um, sumatriptan, which is an abortive. So if the headache is already there, um, and then fluoroset is a rescue medicine for um, headaches as well. It's pretty commonly prescribed in, in the hospital too. Um, unfortunately, Fioracet especially can cause rebound headaches taken every day. Some of the other medicines can too. Um, but those are the common meds that you'll see um, in you know multiple categories. Uh, a lot of folks have kind of medicine, one of these, one of each of these um, on board for chronic pain to kind of get at different types of pain, whether it's musculoskeletal, 
neuropathic and, and kind of address pain in lots of different ways with lots of medicines. Other common treatments for pain, steroid injections and nerve blocks. Um, spinal cord stimulators are a treatment that is sort of for folks for whom surgery is not going to be beneficial, but they've tried a lot of other different um, interventions. So this is uh, where an electrode is implanted that delivers a signal, electrical pulse, um, and it's thought to sort of mask or distract. If you think back to the that picture of the spinal cord, kind of distract the signals that are coming um, out uh, and up into the spinal cord so that the brain doesn't perceive them. Um, an intrathecal pump is also implanted and it delivers pain medicine right into the spinal fluid. Surgical procedures for some folks, um, a TENS machine, which is ex external, but also kind of provides a low level electrical pulse that is intended to distract the signals going up into the brain. Um, and then using heat and cold. And this is one of, I think, my favorite recommendations in um, acute care medical settings, especially. Um, these are really useful tools, actually. Uh, and they're soothing. They're also kind of saying, I hear you. I hear this pain is, is you know, getting in the way of sleeping or it's troublesome after physical therapy comes to see you. Um, and it's got no side effects, which is great, right? Uh, so this is a really useful tool to kind of put right there at the, at the top of the um, list in terms of like a biomedical or physiological intervention. So physical therapy, um, PT can really help with strength, range of motion, flexibility, muscle conditioning, um, can also help with using mobility devices optimally if that's, if those are needed. Um, aqua therapy, and this is insurance will often cover like physical therapy in a pool, which is great, particularly for folks uh, for whom like gravity is challenging or weight bearing is really tough. There's some physical therapy based massages that are really helpful. And then looping in OT as needed um, to help people kind of get really creative about completing um, their ADLs, which is, is so important. I mean, that goes back to our functional goals, right? So and occupational therapists are real, really creative folks um, in my experience. And so can really help kind of you and your patient think through how can I do the things that I need to using kind of a different way of thinking about it, changing my the organization of my kitchen if I want to cook dinner, using a stool, using different tools to make sure I'm able to do the things that I, I want and need to do with additional tools. So complementary and alternative therapies, um, yoga, so kind of mindful movement, um, folks find benefit in acupuncture and chiropractics, um, sort of less data about those two interventions, but kind of people self-report that those are beneficial. Um, biofeedback is a really useful uh, tool for um, treatment of pain as well. So psychological treatment options. Um, education is actually, a, I think, an underappreciated intervention. Um, in my current setting and in a lot of my settings, it's been really brief interactions with patients. So I have kind of, you know, one opportunity um, often to, to provide some kind of intervention, sort of therapeutic assessment and education about chronic pain, um, kind of integrating all of what you have learned thus far, all of what we know about pain in terms of the way it needs to be treated from a holistic perspective and kind of the different ways in which um, pain is treated rather than purely with one pill, right, um, is really beneficial. We'll talk a little bit about the gate control theory, even that kind of um, education can be a nice intervention um, about to help folks living with chronic pain. Um, CBT for chronic pain, and in particular, um, I've used, the VA has a really comprehensive manual, which I've linked at the end of this um, talk. Um, the background section is such a good, uh, like, refresher about kind of the biopsychosocial model and um, treatment for chronic pain, medicines, other types of therapies, so it's an awesome resource. Um, there are also some really nice 
adapted resource literacy adapted resources um, in group format as well that are CBT for chronic pain focused. Um, I'll briefly cover MBSR. Um, I won't cover hypnosis, but that's a really effective treatment for chronic pain. It's a specialized skill requiring really specific training. Um, and then I'm not an ACT therapist myself, um, but I, ACT is a really useful tool um, for folks living with chronic pain, particularly in kind of um, that values focus. Um, and ACT integrates mindfulness and a lot of other tools that I think are um, kind of overlap with some of the other interventions. So CBT, CP, I'm going to talk um, probably the most about, and then just a couple of other notes about other intervention strategies as well. It's good to know theory though, right? Why are we using CBT for chronic pain? Um, why is this a useful tool? So most of us know what CBT is. Um, our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors interact with our situation um, and kind of all of these things interact with each other. Um, for example, I, this is the patient I saw in my previous setting. So he had chronic cervical neck pain. Um, he felt the neck pain when he was mowing the lawn, which was a situation. He felt scared and fearful. That was his emotion. And his thought was something is wrong with me. My neck is injured. Um, and so that was his thought. Then his resulting behavior, of course, if your thought is I'm injured, I feel scared. I was mowing the lawn, moving, being pretty active. So I need to do the opposite of that. And then the behavior is lay on the couch and rest for the rest of the day. So you can see how all of those things kind of interact with one another um, in the context of chronic pain too, um, which is similar in some ways to how we would understand chronic pain to be useful for things like depression or anxiety. Um, and then the other theoretical background um, for CBT for chronic pain is the biopsychosocial model. I'm gonna to move to the next slide. So this slide is a lot, right? Um, and I think I like that it's a lot because it helps us understand the kind of incredible number of things that are interacting with each other in the context of chronic pain. Um, it would be really difficult in going through um, this, if you were kind of just sit with someone with chronic pain and go through all these different things, you would spend three sessions just like writing something next to each of these areas. Um, but I think it helps us as um, providers, no matter what setting we're in, um, to really be mindful of all the ways in which chronic pain, kind of the things affecting development and maintenance of chronic pain, right? Um, and to be kind of, um, be compassionate, I think, about the number of things that are involved here, right? And some things we can't impact, um, even though we want to, right? Even though we're identifying chronic pain as something that's impairing function, um, you know, we can't impact, for example, well, sometimes we can, we can't, it's difficult sometimes to impact like insurance issues, right? Folks may not have um, a alternative insurance option, but their insurance isn't covering what they need. Um, we may not be able to alter right, their family environment or their zip code, um, but we still kind of need to work within that context to say, well, where can we work? What, what can we work on? Um, even though we're respecting those things that are immovable in some ways. So that's kind of the perspective of the biopsychosocial model, particularly as it relates to chronic pain. So this is another kind of theory that's really important in understanding chronic pain and also figuring out how do we intervene. Um, the gate here in the middle, here it is. So the gate here in the middle is um, sort of sensory signals moving up the spinal cord to be processed in the brain. And then of course the brain then sends signals back down to go out into the body, right? Um, there are things that close and open this gate. I think even just kind of having that awareness in itself can be empowering for folks living with chronic pain because often it feels um, like out of their control. There's nothing they can do. Um, they're body is betraying them and, and their body is kind of working against them in every possible way. So even just kind of introducing the idea that, that there, 
pain is bidirectional from the spinal cord and brain. And there are things we can do to intervene there um, is a really nice starting point. Even kind of this alone as an educational piece is really helpful. And this is an, a good handout that I use pretty frequently. So what opens the gate? What allows more pain signals to flood the brain? Certainly depression, anxiety, fear, kind of that negative affective state. Um, mentally focusing on the site of injury. Uh, so really attending very closely to the place on the body where pain originates is going to open that gate. Having a sense of no personal control. Again, if uh, kind of we view pain as biological and you know, our body's out of our control and our body's not kind of following my instructions anymore and not uh, amenable to, to any alteration, we don't have any agency over our bodies is how that can feel. And that certainly is not helpful. Um, again, that often results in some of those negative affective states and negative thoughts, which really open the gate. Um, and then behaviorally, it makes sense that kind of the negative emotional state increased sort of sensory experience of pain with that gate being opened and feeling like we don't have control can lead to social withdrawal. You know, not participating in things that are important, not participating in healthy lifestyle behaviors, um, not participating in work or family life. Um, and that unfortunately continues to open the gate. That's sort of, it's sort of a negative cycle that promotes itself. Um, alternatively, things that close the gate, um, emotional control. Now we can't affect, we can't control whether or not emotions arise. We can control what to do with them. We can respond to them differently, certainly. Um, and that's an area of control that kind of puts how emotions um, change over time into our control. Uh, relaxation, kind of physiologic relaxation. And we'll talk a bit about some tools um, in that regard in a little bit. Mental distraction, particularly distracting from the site of injury. Um, heat and cold and topicals can be really useful tools here too in terms of phys physiologic distraction. Um, so, you know, if we're mentally doing something that is engaging or soothing or interesting, and then we're also using maybe a cold pack, and then after the cold pack, we're following that with like a lidocaine patch, right? Then we're kind of doing each of the things that are, are offering distraction and can reduce the experience um, in terms of intensity of pain. Positive thoughts uh, are really helpful and not like Pollyanna positive thoughts, but kind of thoughts like, I can choose how to respond to this pain. Um, this pain is, is survivable, right? Those things are po actually positive thoughts that can close that gate a little bit. Um, and feed that sense of personal control and agency. And then all of those things kind of then allow for the behavioral result of engaging in things that are enjoyable, which feeds itself in a loop in a positive way. Um, so gate control model is really useful, kind of plugs in like all the things we would work on in CBTCP or any pain intervention um, and is an educational intervention in and of itself. So I have two slides um, from CBTCP, so psychological factors and then behavioral factors. So there are a lot of psychological factors here and I have, do have some more slides to cover. So I really wanna highlight one main thing here um, and that is hurt versus harm. This is a really, um, I think, important place often to, to start from kind of an understanding of chronic pain um, for folks. You know, I think living in the healthcare system that we live in um, and helped by that like pain vital sign where zero pain is the goal and a pill is kind of the way to treat pain because pain is, is bad, um, that a lot of times kind of we and our patients understand that any pain um, is, is actually harmful, right? That pain is injury. Um, and when it comes to chronic pain, I think it's really important to kind of focus on, so having hurt as a, sense, as a physical sensation that doesn't always mean injury. And in this case, we've got, you know, X imaging um, data or uh, like this nerve conduction study data that says, good news, um, you're, you're not being, you're not injured, 
right? There's not an injury that we can see. You still have, have are hurting though, right? So there's not harm, but there is hurt. We can work with hurt, right? We can work to kind of, you know, tune into the hurt, distract physiologically or cognitively, mentally distract, um, but it, it kind of allows us to take down some of, goes into pain cognitions a little bit, goes into catastrophizing um, that, you know, the sensation of hurt does not mean harm, does not mean injury. Um, and that's good news, right? Good news. You're not being injured. Um, like uh, my guy with uh, the neck, cervical neck pain, there's not an injury there. Your imaging looks good from your last doctor's visit. Um, so your job is to kind of say, how do I manage when it hurts, right? Knowing that I'm not, not getting more injured, but I am hurting. So how can I intervene for myself? So I think that's the, I'll leave it at that. And I'm happy to come back to that depending on how much time we have. Um, so behavioral factors, um, probably the most common thing that I see in any setting is a challenging cycle of underactivity and overactivity. Um, folks will, you know, and this, all these kind of different things, including the psychological psychological factors are connected to one another, right? Because you can imagine, you know, feeling scared, thinking I'm injured or I'm becoming more injured is going to lead to resting and underactivity. Um, and then folks might kind of have this sort of urge to re-engage in things and then become overactive, right? And try to do a couple of days things in one day. Um, or feel this kind of sense of urgency from family members or other folks in their life to really like, catch up on things and then are overactive and then need a day in bed to recover. Um, so that's a really common cycle, un unfortunate, unhelpful cycle um, for a lot of folks with chronic pain and even things like chronic fatigue, even um, kind of other physical disabilities or injuries or even normal aging. Um, I think folks can kind of tend not to tune into what they need to do from a, um, an, a pacing themselves perspective in terms of activity. So then the other thing I'll highlight here is activity pacing. This is an awesome tool um, where, you know, I often will start with, you know, so if you're like most people, you know, you overwork yourself and then you need a day to recover and folks go, oh my gosh, yes. I spend the whole day in bed the next day. Um, it's terrible. I feel guilty because I can't do things. And then I feel even extra tired and my body is more tired from spending the whole day in bed. And my pain is the same. It's still going to be, it's still high, right? I've laid in bed all day and I'm still in a lot of pain. Um, so, so we talk about activity pacing as this alternative, right? And the important part is to set your goal of working and resting before you even get started. So I'll have folks use like a worksheet or just say it out loud. Um, how many minutes uh, of this activity do you want to do? So if it's mowing the lawn, it's, you know, I would say start by doing five minutes and we're using minutes and not tasks um, because minutes we can start and stop. A lot of folks feel obligated to finish a task. So activity pacing is minutes based. So you do five minutes of mowing when the alarm on your phone goes off, you pause, you set the alarm again to start and you do three minutes of resting right from the beginning, right? Um, and you work five minutes on, three minutes off and you set the time for each of those activities so that we're going by the clock. You may feel like you don't need it quite yet um, and you know adjust it. So maybe you find that you can work for 10 minutes, rest for five minutes, um, but the goal is to rest before you need it so that you have more fuel in the tank to get back to working, right? And at the end of that activity, um, you still have enough energy to be able to, to kind of rest appropriately, but not spend the whole day in bed. Uh, one of the things I hear back is, well, then it will take me three hours to move on instead of just one hour. And my response is, well, it takes, it'll take three hours to mow the lawn, but it's actually taking you one hour to mow the lawn plus 24 hours of resting. So it's actually 25 hours, right? So three hours, 25 hours, and then you could use that extra time in the 25 hours that you would have needed for recovery, right, of that activity to do something else, 
to, in a way that, that uses pacing. So you can be actually more productive, right? Um, and respectful of your body. So activity pacing is an awesome tool. It's behavioral. So for folks who, um, you know, buy-in is challenging sometimes for cognitive interventions. Not everyone is available for cognitive interventions for all sorts of different reasons. Pacing is really useful. Um, it can be used in physical therapies. It's useful at home, at work, um, all sorts of different places where activity pacing can be really, really beneficial. Uh, okay, so MBSR, um, initially, John Kabat-Zinn, who actually is not a psychologist, I forgot what his PhD is in, but not psychology, interestingly. Um, he developed MBSR and first published a paper in 1979 for treatment-resistant folks with chronic pain. Um, the core intervention of MBSR is mindfulness. So paying attention to the present moment intentionally and without judgment. Based on what we've talked about so far, you can already see how mindfulness is a really, really important tool, um, a really kind of nice mindset to use in managing chronic pain. And so the kind of three big parts of um, MBSR are the mindfulness meditation, mindful movement and yoga, and then body awareness, like a body scan. Um, this is, I mean, I'm less likely to use this as kind of a formalized intervention, but it's a really nice tool for lots of folks for lots of different reasons. Um, and at, sometimes I think talking through the mindfulness thing that it's not a religion or something like that. And it can be complementary to, to folks existing religions can sometimes be like a starting point from a buy-in standpoint. Um, but you can see how MBSR incorporates some of the same things that we're doing in any of these interventions, which is there's kind of a physiological perspective from the movement, there's the cognitive and there's the emotional, right? Um, so we're kind of targeting all different areas um, in terms of using MBSR. That's a really nice intervention too, lots of research since then. So, Motivational interviewing is, I mean, I think a core skill for all of us in any setting, no matter what kind of provider that you are, um, from nursing to therapy to physicians and APPs, psychologists, um, therapists, even folks who are maybe primarily um, do testing, right? And maybe not as much intervention, but MI is, I think, a core skill for all of us, particularly for this patient population. I especially like how MI is really collaborative, which is so important for working with this population um, and goal oriented Again, functional goals are, are the key to making progress. Um, and so I really like that goal oriented um, attitude of MI. And then MI is, of course, focused on enhancing someone's own motivation, their own reasons for change. You know, they've got to come up with that. We can come up with all sorts of reasons and site research and um, all that kind of stuff. But it's not gonna be very meaningful, but what is meaningful is, you know, I wanna sit on the ground with my grandkids and play with them. That's, that's meaningful and motivating. And um, MI is really useful in terms of strategies to target someone's own motivation. And then lastly, it's just really respectful and accepting of the other person, which is so critical. A lot of folks with chronic pain have had invalidating experiences with um, the healthcare system for lots of reasons and allowing us to roll with, roll with resistance um, is so critical in working with this population and, and being effective. So we wanna treat comorbid mental health conditions. That's, I mean, you're not gonna make much headway functionally either, uh, much less in pain. Um, change with pain experience if we're not addressing comorbid mental health conditions. I think the, the what I want to emphasize, though, is that our, our interventions for depression and anxiety and even trauma um, overlap with our interventions for chronic pain. So kind of we can, we can mix interventions work doubly well um, for kind of addressing behavioral challenge, like behavioral interventions for depression, like behavioral activation and scheduling work really nice with pacing, for example, um, challenging and helpful thoughts in the context of depression 
are the same tools we're using to challenge unhelpful thoughts related to pain. And maybe those thoughts are kind of the same, right? The thoughts related to pain also involve um, negative assessments of self, right? That are related to depression. Same with anxiety um, and panic. So using diaphragmatic breathing, um, relaxation, body scans, those tools for anxiety management work well in chronic pain too. So we can use tools that work well for both mental health conditions and chronic pain. Um, so kind of you know, maximize your existing skill set with treating these mental health conditions too. Um, riding the wave can be really helpful as a pain, a pain coping strategy in the midst of a pain episode too. Um, trauma is really, really um, critical to address and maybe not kind of directly in terms of like CPT, right? Um, but a, a lot of symptoms may overlap in terms of chronic pain and trauma. Certainly using trauma-informed care if you're doing things that involve physical touch. So you want to be really respectful um, in terms of kind of letting folks know what you're going to do with as it relates to physical touch, whether it's like a nursing or a physical therapy care activity um, or taking vitals or a physical exam, kind of say verbally what you're going to do first um, and then say it out loud as you're doing it um, and discuss anything that, that kind of tune into to folks who maybe appear triggered um, or express that they feel triggered. So using trauma-informed care is, is critical for every setting that you're doing. Um, but particularly knowing that trauma and chronic pain are comorbid. Um, grounding is a really nice sort of mindfulness-based tool that's helpful for folks when they're feeling activated from uh, trauma-related triggers, um, but also useful in pain too, pain management too. Um, you could do nightmare restructuring if folks are having kind of insomnia that's maybe related to trauma symptoms and or pain. And then sometimes addressing core beliefs. So sometimes the core beliefs related to trauma overlap with core beliefs about pain um, and about kind of experience or um, capability in managing um, pain or trauma symptoms. So you might be able to kind of address a couple of things in working with core beliefs. So treating comorbid opioid substance use disorder specifically, um, 91% of patients in a study of patients entering a pain and opioid treatment program um, had a comorbid access one disorder. That's not surprising, um, likely to most of us. Certainly opioid substance use disorder can be occurring with chronic pain, including folks who are treated with opioids for chronic pain. Um, really important to be mindful of dosing, even if you're a non-prescriber like myself, um, I want to be tuned into kind of where folks are in terms of their morphine milligram equivalents. You can use that little calculator there, which is really nice. Um, it kind of tells you what dose of that medicine um, is equal to one milligram of morphine. Um, so what we know is that 50 morphine milligram equivalents or greater is two times as likely of an overdose compared to 20. Um, folks who are on 100 morphine milligram equivalents are nine times more likely to die by overdose. So, you know, we want to be mindful of and kind of maybe um, join in the conversation with the prescribing providers and other team members um, for folks who kind of are having difficulties in terms of functioning specifically related to their opioid use in addition to their chronic pain. Um, it's really hard to treat without buy-in from everybody on the team. Again, that's where I think your uh, my tools are going to be so, so important. Um, and slow tapering is really critical. Um, it's sort of tapering too quickly or without buy-in from patient really increases the risk of suicide. So um, it's so important to really be part of the whole team. Um, in terms of working with opioid substance use disorder, of course, involve your specialists like addiction medicine, um, psychological treatment, both behavioral pain management um, and also mental health treatment, um, addressing, of course, the comorbid mental health symptoms, screening for suicidality, um, and then addressing any of those other social issues that may be um, sort of reinforcing um, or interfering with, uh, with treatment in any way. Um, last 
but not, I mean, almost last, um, <laughs> but not least, uh, treating other health behaviors. So insomnia is so common um, among folks with chronic pain, sometimes treating it directly um, using maybe CBTI or other tools can be really, really important. Um, if any of us have had a poor night of sleep, we know how hard it is to manage the next day. Um, you can imagine folks who also are trying to manage chronic pain on top of every thing else that they're trying to manage without good rest is, um, is really challenging. Um, smoking cessation. So sometimes the comorbid um, illnesses like um, peripheral artery disease uh, or diabetes, other medical conditions um, are worsened and by smoking. I mean, smoking is associated with risks of all sorts physically. Um, but so sometimes our role can be to help folks kind of take good care of their health, which in turn um, prevents their illnesses from worsening, which affects how their pain um, evolves over time. Um, I put alcohol use here. I, I kind of take the perspective of alcohol use in general as health behavior, um, because for a lot of folks, even cutting back um, can be really beneficial for them. Alcohol can enter act with other health conditions that can interact with medications. Um, so lots of, I think, uh, good reasons often to consider cutting back and we can be a tool um, for folks in that regard too. Increasing physical activity, both through, you know, kind of getting connected with physical therapy, aqua therapy, um, yoga, any other complementary kind of activity-based treatment. Um, we can kind of help folks with accountability, uh, with setting reasonable goals. Um, we can work with other team members to manage things that are getting in the way of physical activity and um, address barriers potentially, especially if they're behavioral or cognitive. Um, we can help folks stay on top of their other medications and other medical um, conditions. Certainly managing medicines appropriately is a core skill in chronic, kind of good chronic pain management. Um, so we want patients to really be empowered to manage their medicines correctly, to utilize them correctly, um, and and sometimes we can we can help on that front too. And then lastly, um, any dietary changes or unhelpful eating habits again, as it relates to other um, illnesses that are either interacting with chronic pain or the causal effect of chronic pain. So we certainly can intervene um, in these areas in terms of health behavior as well. So in summary, um, I hope you all have been tuning into your stereotypes and biases about chronic pain, who patients are that have chronic pain as we've gone through this talk. Um, hopefully you feel better able to assess pain and especially the functional impact of pain um, to set goals related to function um, and to use lots of different interventions when addressing chronic pain. And then lastly, of course, consult with specialists, communicate with other members of the team um, even if we are in one office all the way over here, you know, we, you know, should reach out to physical therapy, to the PCP, to other specialists. Of course, um, if we're in, net, in our own network and or have our consent from patients, but I think we can make a pretty strong case to patients as to why communicating with our other team members really benefits them and benefits their functional goals. So um, do communicate. I think that's really beneficial. All right, these are my additional readings for y'all. And otherwise I will be glad to take questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Anastasiades. Um, so before we jump into the questions, just a few notes regarding the CE avails and the process of getting that credit and showing you know, proof of attendance. So I've put two links in the chat. I'm also going to pull up this uh, slide here for you all so that you can see, you can scan that if you're um, using a computer. Otherwise, you will still get, you know, an email tomorrow um, with these links. So please do complete those. Um, it's not instant, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time to tally all of the evaluations and attendance records. And once those are submitted to each discipline, 
um, each you know timeline is going to be different. So give us a little bit of grace with that. Um, and instead of certificates, we've moved away from that. Um, and you can print your CE broker transcript directly from the web as proof of attendance. If you are not a license holder, we will you know fashion an independent certificate for you in those cases. So reach out to behavioral health. Uh, education at bmcjax.com. So the first question, Dr. A, how can healthcare providers work with patients to develop a comprehensive pain management plan that takes into account their unique needs, preferences, and goals? Um, I mean, that's an awesome question. I I hope you feel more kind of able to do that after this talk, because I, you know, I think the um, best way to do that is to um, kind of tune into, you know, how each member of the team is treating their pain, right? Um, kind of understanding what medicines are there that you're working with, what ways have you already identified that really, in, you know, make pain better, make pain worse? Um, what if, what things have you already tried? Um, what things are in your environment are there that can we not change? So we want to just be mindful of those and kind of respectful that those things exist and see how we can work around them. Um, and then otherwise, hearing from the patient what's important to them. What are they want to be able to do, or how do they want to maybe think differently or um, feel differently as it relates to their chronic pain. So I think kind of assessing in terms of like medical records and history, but also hearing from them directly, what's important? Um, what do I want to do differently? Great. And how might healthcare providers ensure that patients with chronic pain have access to resources and support that they need to manage it over the long term? And in your, you know, opinion, are these do they typically um, bear a large expense? You know, um, if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a really tough question because, um, you know, we as a healthcare system aren't great at kind of managing folks over the long term, unfortunately. Um, you know, I I think if insurance companies um, and the sort of healthcare systems were willing to invest in things like a formalized pain program, um, there are some of those across the country. Those are really beneficial for long term, but they're more costly in the short term, right? Um, and nowadays, insurance companies don't pay for a formalized program where kind of, you know, folks, they go nine to five, almost like IOP or PHP, but for chronic pain, um, that there used to be more of those. It's, it's harder and harder to find those. So I think kind of working within what you've got um, available to you, depending on where you are in the healthcare system, I think, you know, anytime you're inter interacting with a patient and you can provide some of that education, kind of focus on self-management. Um, I think kind of you're doing what you can, right? Um, I'm in an acute medical setting, so I don't see folks over the long term. It's hard for me to, to kind of make sure they have what they need long term, but I do what I can to kind of connect them, offer education, give them tools in the moment. Um, and I think that's true even if you're an outpatient provider, right, that you you do have some limitations there too. Maybe insurance gives you 15 sessions, right? And you have to ask for more. Um, so, you know, I think you've got to work within your system, kind of within the spot in the system where you live, um, as a provider and, and you use these tools as best you can. Um, there are some nice websites and things like that you could direct folks to so that it, they can continue to use these tools over the long term. Um, there's a nice, um, app from the VA, which is really helpful for folks to use after, um, like formalized treatment is over. Um, but otherwise, I, when I was an outpatient provider, said, you know, come back for booster sessions and come back for one or two sessions. We kind of review your tools, what's working and what's not, and kind of tweaked accordingly. So I, that's not a great answer, but I, I don't know that there is an answer to that question, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's unique to each person. So it's hard to give like, a, you know, a straight one that would reach all populations. Yeah. In, in your opinion, do you feel patients can learn to manage themselves after they've been exposed to a course of treatment? Or, you know, as you're noting, like booster sessions, do you think it's more common that people rely on those over the lifespan? Um, I actually think using a booster session is good self-management because on the daily, they're doing their kind of, they're using their treatment plan of self-management accordingly. And to come back in six months for one or two sessions is actually a really excellent use. 
I think of their treatment plan, which is to say, I'm using my plan um, and I'm seeing where it's not working for me and I need to tweak it. And then I'm gonna go back out into the world and continue to use it. Um, but even kind of, uh, even folks who have sort of really challenging complex cases, I've seen them make progress, right? And so, I, so yes, I think um, people really can use these tools and continue to use them over the long term to really good effect. And you know, what recommendations do you have for patients that maybe you encounter that are unwilling to use CBT, you know, mindfulness, and they just they just want medication? You know, yeah. how do you approach that? So some people are really biologically, physiologically focused. Um, and so my kind of behavioral intervention there still is, how are you using your medicines? How are you using positioning? How are you using heat and cool? Um, when are you using them? How are they working for you? Are they allowing you to be more um, productive, more functional, to rest better? Uh, certainly you can kind of use some behavioral interventions. I mean, pacing is, is not cognitive, right? It's behavioral. So you can say, how are you pacing in the context of your daily life activities with the use of your medicines, with the use of your hot and cold packs and your topicals, right? So I, I think you can intervene on a behavioral level um, and get by in there without being, you know, too therapisty or feeling like we're doing psychological treatment, but we are doing a really nice intervention um, and kind of go at it from that angle. Absolutely. And uh, your colleague, Dr. Sarah Bertak, uh, just had some feedback for the group. The state of Oregon has implemented a mandatory evaluation by mental health providers if a patient's being prescribed opioids for any type of pain beyond acute care. And she noted it's a great way to get services early on to prevent negative cognitions and behaviors as a result of chronic pain. So really that preventative you know, aspect. Absolutely. And, and when I worked in family medicine, the um, primary care docs would also send folks to us for a psychological, like a biopsychosocial assessment before prescribing opioids too. So we could kind of target things that were maybe the potential for high risk as well. So I know our um, prescribing colleagues are utilizing us and, and certainly see firsthand how we all kind of need to work together to be um, hopefully preventive a little bit rather than kind of reactionary to like an existing long-term chronic pain plus opioid use disorder, which is really challenging. Certainly. Uh, just to answer Senny Hampton's question, so for a CNA or a um, HUC, how do you get credit for verification? So if you do not carry a license that would upload the credit to CE broker, you would email behavioral health education at bmcjax.com. So in those cases that there is not a license and you don't have a transcript, you know, to print for your records of proof, then we'll fashion that for you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Dr. Anastasiades, for your time today. Um, and if anyone wants a copy of the PDF of the slides, we've already actually received requests for them. <laughs> so um, it's been, you know, a great talk, uh, very much uh, relevant, you know, to this to this group here. So you guys can email that same one that I just noted. Um, and yes, you would use your um, CNA license number. Sunny, okay. But yes, any follow-up questions related to slides, we have a recording that we can send to you too, um, or a certificate for those that do not have a license affiliated with CE Broker, email us, okay? And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Please join us uh, next month uh, at the end of April. Dr. Galloway is going to be talking about dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. So looking forward to that. See you all then. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Okay, bye-bye.